everybody. So we are going to start, say so within a couple of minutes, and uh, all those who are standing outside, please enter the hall. So we are going to start, and uh, those sitting behind at the back, instead of sitting scattered, no, please come forward and sit here in the front benches. So we are going to start. so kind enough those who are sitting in the back to come forward a little bit. It's not so pleasant to speak to a very empty hall. Please. So, um, <clears throat> we are beginning the second day of our seminar. We are starting off with a presentation by Professor K. Udaya Kumar, who is probably quite well known to everyone here and who really doesn't need an introduction. But still, for the sake of formality, uh, Professor Uday was my senior at the Institute of English, which I have to say. Uh, uh, he did his DPhil at uh, Oxford, after which he worked at the University of Pune, Delhi University, and is currently uh, with the Jawaharlal Nehru University as professor of English. Uh, he also served for a short time in Partha Chatterjee's Institute in Calcutta, Center for Studies in Social Sciences. Uh, and as far as his work goes, Probably to a Malayali audience, there is no need to talk about his work on Narayana Guru, which is a phenomenal piece of work, and which to a great extent changed, transformed the understanding of Guru, especially in terms of Kerala's indigenous or Kerala's own structures of modernity and its ways of thinking. His work, Writing the Self, has also been a very important work looking at narratives, primarily from Kerala, and how the self gets represented in different narrative contexts. Um, Uday has also, at the same time, one should say has been involved, and these works too are indications of that, of interdisciplinary work, where, especially in terms of history, readings of history, and with the assistance of social sciences theorization, has actually brought in uh, what one would call a paradigm shift within literary studies, which seems to border or where the dividing line between literary studies and cultural studies uh, really gets redefined. The department is extremely happy that uh, Professor Uday came here. He refused to take any other position, but he wanted to make a presentation just like any else. No inauguration, no valedictory. He wanted to be, that's probably his urge to be, to feel young, I guess. So anyway, he insisted that he shall be like any other presenter. So on your behalf, uh, great welcome to you, sir. Please. 
generous and uh, exaggerated words. <laughs> uh, and thank you, uh, Umar and Janaki, for inviting me. Uh, I'm so delighted to be part of this very special occasion of uh, what I can only call an intensely affectionate intellectual tribute to uh, Professor Minarayanan, uh, whose work uh, has been very influential, and I have a very deep respect and admiration for Narayanan's work uh, over, the, over the years. Uh, it is uh, difficult to believe that Narayanan is retiring. Uh, if there were any natural justice in the world, <laughs> many people, uh, including me, should retire from our universities much before him. But we know that the world is not a fair one. Uh, the only consolation that I have when I think about this is that Narayan will have an e even more active and fuller life, both intellectually and otherwise, in the years to come, which I'm not sure I can say about myself, you know, but definitely about him. Uh, I know that, and I look forward to witnessing that, engaging with it, and also the share, sharing the benefit of all that is to come. Now, uh, it was also very delight, delightful and fulfilling for me uh, to listen to the exciting work uh, on cultural history and cultural studies which was presented yesterday by many scholars. Uh, and, and young scholars, you know, for me this is uh, an important thing because uh, in one's life probably one reaches a certain point in time when you find that you are learning increasingly from people who are much younger to you. Like, I find that in the, uh, when I make courses, uh, take decisions on what kind of readings to recommend, increasingly I find that I am actually learning, the scholars I am learning from, uh, most of them, or many of them, or the majority of them, uh, really came to this planet after me. Yeah? So I find that, therefore, a deeply educative experience uh, to come to an occasion like this, where we have actually a large number of scholars uh, who are, in terms of their age, younger to us, younger to people like me or Narayanan, uh, and uh, who present fresh insights and new ways of looking at things. Now, uh, I also have a slight trepidation in, in participating in this event in relationship to the thematics of the event. You know, that's really because of my, my own kind of um, uh, somewhat ambivalent and complex relationship to what has come to be institutionally established as cultural studies. Uh, I have a very strong interest in that. Certainly I have a very, very strong interest in that. In that. And its uh, particular trajectories it has assumed in India. And there I agree with Anil that rather than think about cultural studies as having a particular origin in Birmingham or later on in the United States or something like that, and then uh, coming to India and we try to match it with the original to assess it, one should really look at what are the kind of unique located trajectories it has assumed, uh, how did it emerge in the Indian context, in the Kerala context, etc., etc., and, and that I'm very, very interested in. Now, uh, th this is also related to a, a process of intellectual translation which happens uh, with labels like cultural studies. Uh, think about subaltern studies. We know that uh, Ranajit Guho, who uh, seemingly founded, or at least organized the School of Subaltern Studies, uh, he borrowed the term from Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks. And he uses it in a way which is somewhat different from what Gramsci did. And Gramsci himself is taking the word from elsewhere and changing the meaning of that. And probably about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, we organized a discussion on the translation of subaltern studies into different Indian languages. And it was fascinating what uh, that signifier meant in different linguistic and cultural contexts. For example, in Tamil Nadu, uh, subaltern studies really signified uh, a focus on Dalit cultures and Dalit studies. 
Uh, in Bengal, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the domain of subordinate studies is defined very clearly in relationship to uh, two kinds of archives. One coming from the colonial archives, and the other coming from a kind of what you may call a nationalist archive, which eventually merges with the archive of the nation state. Yeah? So, so the positioning of this word itself, what it does, is very, very different in the different contexts. <clears throat> so uh, the way I think about cultural studies is also a little similar to this, you could say. You know? Like, what does it do in different places? And in, in Kerala, it's particularly interesting because we know that uh, the really important intellectual work uh, uh, intellectual work and ideas really come from outside the university. Uh, and in that sense, the real creativity or intellectual ferment is really something uh, which has its most active energies outside the university, and the university lags behind that often, and sometimes at attempts to codify it in some way, institutionalize it in some way, and in that process, of course, as we are always, you know, it's always the case that there are losses as well as gains in that process. Yeah. Now, uh, cultural studies uh, in the context of India, uh, especially outside Kerala, uh, I see that it has, it has had, at least there are three institutional trajectories which I have been familiar with. And one of them, as Narayanan indicated, I also had the fortune to be actively involved in one of them for a certain period of time. Uh, that was in relationship to the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta, uh, which uh, used to organize these annual culture studies workshops in which a large number of young scholars used to come and to discuss new uh, questions and problems which can be investigated in the field of contemporary culture and also engage with new scholarship that is emerging in the area. Now, uh, in the work which is the way in which culture studies was, uh, inquiry was delineated or understood uh, in the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, you could say, drew upon the engagement with history that many of the faculty members there uh, were seriously preoccupied with. And I would say that, uh, I mean, I ran and mentioned uh, Pastor Chatterjee's name here, and he was the director in some of those crucial years at that center. And this also has uh, some parallel with the shift in Pastor Chatterjee's own work from looking at uh, subaltern consciousness, which is one of the earlier ways of formulating uh, the object of subaltern studies, to a kind of domain of uh, political life, which he called political society, as distinct from civil society. And you could say that this move in Chatterjee's own work was, uh, in some sense, inspired, again, some translation happening there, by Michel Foucault's uh, uh, work on governmentality and trying to understand the consequences of the idea of governmentality uh, in places like India. Under certain special conditions of capitalism, certain kinds of state formation, yeah. what happens to governmentality, and how does it affect the way in which subjectivities are formed, the political and the cultural are defined, etc., etc. So this was, uh, in some sense, the the guiding uh, guiding thread of thought behind the kind of inquiries uh, that we were engaged in. Now, this also opened up a large number of new questions, some of which interestingly came up in yesterday's presentations. Like, uh, this is also, we know that the 1990s onwards, we have a larger consumer uh, market, uh, and the way in which consumption itself needs to be thought in relationship to contemporary life, uh, perhaps we need new tools for that. Yeah. In the sense that the, an earlier model of consumption which thinks about the consumer as a passive uh, object of manipulation by the suppliers of commodities, now needs to be rethought in a way where you can also recognize various kinds of agentiveness which are at work in consumption. There have been very interesting studies about new forms of consumption, especially from previously underprivileged communities or communities which did not have 
access to expendable cash, yeah, and how it has led to a very significant uh, new avenues for articulation of distinctive identities. And this is not only true about India. Uh, there has been very, very interesting work from post-apartheid South Africa, for instance, about uh, supermarkets, fashion, sartorial habits, and uh, how that, those things change. When people have access to certain kinds of spaces, which are public, yeah, and certain kinds of spaces like shopping malls, etc., etc. So, an earlier model of uh, consumption, which actually thinks about this purely in terms of manipulation, uh, does not really explain it. I'm not suggesting that uh, consumption is a wonderful thing. No. I'm suggesting that its consequences and the way it acquires a life as a political cultural practice is not completely exhausted by an analysis of commodity fetishism in a very narrow sense of the term. This is all I am saying. And you know, yesterday there were uh, uh, some very interesting questions about the idea of the fetish, and definitely the idea of fetish has these possibilities. If you think about it closely, we can see that it can become a kind of gateway into thinking about new possibilities in cultural life and political life that come up. Now, alongside uh, the center's own work, which actually um, did not really have a very clear, clearly defined disciplinary unit called cultural studies, it had something named cultural studies, but uh, uh, the kind of research that uh, we were doing within that unit was not necessarily what one would identify as cultural studies. I would, I would come to that in a moment, what is that distinctive thing? which enables people to identify something as cultural studies. Yeah. Uh, parallel to this, you also see the emergence of cultural studies in a more clearly institutional framework in uh, Center for Studies in Culture and Society, Bangalore, which had unfortunately had uh, a short life, relatively short life, uh, but uh, it was a very exciting short life, I would say, the kind of training and the kind of uh, uh, rigor with which uh, the domain was investigated during those years, uh, which had a focus on culture and democracy as the key focal point of attention of cultural studies. And then you also have the work which has been happening over the years in English and Foreign Language University Hyderabad, which has again produced some of the most important uh, faculty members in the field of cultural studies. Uh, at least they regard as very, very important in cultural studies like uh, Martha Prasad or Susi Taru uh, uh, or Satya, you know, Satya Narayana. So, uh, there again, there is a keener engagement with the question of identities, assertion, and the life of democracy. And so, this kind of work is much more focused on contemporary culture. The research, the teaching is really focused on contemporary culture. And one would probably say that that is really what has uh, uh, distinguished the, that domain called cultural studies from other kinds of inquiries which have taken place around it. Kind of focus on uh, the contemporary. Now, Anil had some uh, criticisms of that move in his opening remarks, you know, which, which I uh, understand, I'll also come to that, that he, he felt that a kind of narrow uh, slice of time and a synchronic investigation of a narrow slice of time may actually obscure the historical processes which actually give rise to them. Now, this is what, what he was uh, uh, trying to suggest. Now, uh, so therefore, you could say that cultural studies has had a kind of tense relationship with, uh, I, I would call it a productively tense relationship with uh, the notion of cultural history. Cultural history and cultural studies even though they share certain common concerns, there is a difference in the, what they privilege, what they focus on, what they bring to the foreground. Yeah. Now, uh, there uh, I would say that the kind of idea of the contemporary that cultural studies at its best brings to focus is somewhat different from the more um, ordinary language understanding of the word contemporary. What I mean by that is we tend to think about contemporary in terms of existing at the same time, being together at the same time if we go by the etymology of the word, 
And often people tend to think about it as a certain uh, idea, certain unit of realization, a shifting goalpost of realization, you could say. Yeah. But we know that uh, many philosophers in recent times, uh, of which probably Agamben, as they say on the apparatus, is seminal, uh, have questioned this idea and have tried to show that contemporary needs to be understood as something which cannot be accommodated into a linear narrative template of periodization of time. In other words, the relationship, contemporary is a relationship to the present. And the relationship is, as Agamben would say, one of dissonance and anachronism. So it is not something which can be located within a chronology. It is something which is a bit ecstatic in relationship to chronology, something which stands out, which you cannot smooth back into that chronological timeline. Now, I say that cultural studies at its best or at its most invigorating adopts a similar kind of temporal approach. Uh, is really because what it tries to accomplish uh, at its most refreshing moments is to make us feel that we do not know our present. We do not really know what is it that this world around us is. Things which we take as familiar to us, as things which we can place in terms of an available historical time, you could say cultural studies tries to look at them as if they are totally unfamiliar to us, and then tries to see what is really going on there. Now, in order to do that, you need to have, as a methodological principle, you need to suspend the availability of historical narratives. That's a methodological one. Availability of narrative templates which are linear, which are explanatory, etc., etc., linear or dialectical or whatever you may want to call it. But that's a methodological uh, move uh, to isolate this for investigation. Cultural studies at its less invigorating moments, which of course uh, always that is more numerous than the more invigorating moments, like in all disciplines and all problem areas, probably all avenues of human inquiry, uh, this isolation leads to a celebratory rehearsal of the object. That is, you actually imitate the object, you perform the object, you work on uh, a popular cultural artifact or a popular cultural practice, you describe it in a quasi-euphoric tone, which is available to the academic precisely because the academic is located at a certain distance from popular life and derive a certain, uh, what one may call it, a, a certain vicarious engagement uh, with popular life. So I have seen both these, uh, you know, all of us have seen examples of both these uh, in the domain of cultural studies. Yeah. So uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that what distinguishes cultural studies at its most effective and most uh, life moments is a problematization of our relationship to the present. When it is discarded for a comforting explanation of the present, a comforting redescription of the present in quasi-familiar terms, then probably it, it does not really produce new insights. It may actually produce the impression of new insights. Now, this, this has uh, been one of the things uh, uh, which has made me uh, find it difficult to locate myself as a practitioner of that uh, disciplinary space of cultural studies. Uh, my, my own work, you know, in whatever little work I have done, uh, has tried to look at things, you could say, at the two borders of this kind of space. On the one hand, uh, trying to look at certain formations which are effective in the present at their moments of emergence uh, uh, at a certain moment in history, let's say, uh, trying to look at them uh, in terms of their diagrammatic structure. I'll explain this idea of a diagram in a little while. Um, 
that could be seen as uh, the material which you deal with may be seen as things which would one would usually classify as historical material. Yeah. And, and on the other hand, engaging with another kind of uh, participation, immersion, analysis of an object, which happens again close to that space of cultural studies, which is literary studies in the Indian context. Uh, I say this because uh, apart from the institutions which I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the work in cultural studies has come from literature departments, be it by students or by faculty members or even in terms of syllabi. So there my uh, attempt has been to look at certain ways of reading or certain ways of yielding which is intrinsic to literature, but again to isolate or find out some formal patterns which emerge there which are not completely unique to literature, which may also have a life outside the domain of literature. Some of these things uh, I shall try to explain uh, in the remaining time, but if there are questions, of course, we can talk more about them. Now, I, this is not a talk about my work, but I just wanted to uh, speak about this slight uh, uh, tenuous uh, relationship that I have maintained with what one may call the disciplinary habits and uh, protocols of uh, cultural studies. Uh, Yeah, so uh, in this approach, uh, there is also an attempt to move away from certain templates of cultural criticism, you know, which uh, Anil spoke about yesterday in detail, you know, and uh, which come from a certain moment in thinking about culture, you know, and uh, certain very pioneering and important work which try to look at culture in terms which are different from uh, the tools which were made available in what we call the early intellectual history of Marxist thought and Marxist forms of analysis. Frankfurt School, of course, is extremely important in that uh, moment. And also the particular practices uh, that uh, Anil uh, indicated by speaking about T.K. Ramachandran's work and the work of some of his contemporaries at that time, uh, of which ideology was a very important concept and very central concept. Uh, the kind of work which I am trying to indicate also takes some distance from uh, what we usually understand by the word ideology. And, and here uh, I am of course caricaturing the rich possibilities that a concept of that kind necessarily has. There is a certain preoccupation in ideology, in uses of ideology, either with uh, consciousness or with representations and meanings. And we know that cultural studies itself, in some of its early theoretical elaborations in the Western context, stressed precisely this domain of representations and meanings, like uh, uh, some of the early work of Stuart Hall, early theorizing of Stuart Hall uh, about this, uh, draws on uh, work by people like Althusser, for instance, or Gramsci, on the other hand, really by thinking about culture as uh, a meaning-making practice. So essentially, we are looking at signification, really. We are looking at an analysis of signifying systems, the, the way they produce meaning, and how meanings cohere, etc., etc. So uh, there is a kind of privileging of the model of meaning there. Whereas some of the things which are uh, uh, new forms of inquiry, not only within that space of cultural studies, but also in adjacent disciplinary areas have moved away from the relationship between representations and their meanings to what I may call practices in the use of objects. These objects may be representations, they may be statements, they may be material objects. Yeah. And this use itself is not always completely explicable in terms of meanings and their actualization. Looking at a practice ways of doing, you may not really be able to produce a lexicon. What you may need is more like 
a, a kind of inquiry into uh, what Wittgenstein would call language games. Yeah. Like how are moves made? What is actually an acceptable move? Yeah. Now, the acceptable move is not really reducible to some meaning, actualization of a meaningful intention. Yeah. Uh, it is about, uh, uh, definitely there is a question of relationships involved in that. But relationships themselves are defined or understood in relationship to a practice rather than pre-existing uh, intending uh, participants or subjects. A lot of work, very inspiring work, has come from uh, what we uh, used, a discipline which we used to approach with some disdain, that is anthropology. And we know that over the last uh, 30 or 35 years, anthropology really exists as a critique of anthropology, you could say. Yeah? And, and uh, a lot of very important work has come from there which precisely uh, prioritizes this question of practice and some of the difficult issues which emerge from that. So I feel that uh, the cultural studies engagement with representations has also gained quite a lot by this shift towards looking at practices. And practices have dimensions which may not be fully understandable using the concept of ideology if you use it essentially as a meaning-making uh, kind of paradigm. Uh, so, uh, this also has some bearing on approaching the question of literature. Uh, Anil had, uh, had a very beautiful phrase to characterize the particular positioning of literature in the Kerala public uh, life. He called it Sahitithinde Tridharashtralingana. And I, I really love that phrase. Uh, Tridharashtralingana has also some very interesting things because of the blindness of Tridharashtra. So uh, if it is a crushing embrace, it is also a blind embrace. Yeah. So some of the ways in which we try to distance ourselves from this literary ideology, so to say, or the all-encompassing claims which are made about the symbolic centrality of literature. I do not know if any other part of India we call writers samskarika nayaganma. So, you know, I'm not saying it ironically, it's just from an anthropological neutrality that I would like us to think about. Um, participant observation. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, some of the ways in which we try to withdraw from this claims of literature and submit it to a kind of critique we should also think of them as produced by that nature of the literary discourse itself. That is, the literary discourse itself produces a certain position from which you can actually look at it as if it is an ideological formulation and through a certain set of literary procedures reveal what is its underbelly, what is its hidden interest, etc., etc. Now, this is possible because literary discourse itself is a complex formation. It is not uh, a, a, a simple structure of representations which uh, actualize an ideology. It is a much more complex formation, so we need to look at, into the genealogy of this formation. We need to look at how it came into existence. And when I say this, I'm also thinking about literature not as uh, something which was there always. Uh, the, these particular operations we perform on text now and the larger meanings uh, which we give to them, which also is what uh, creates the possibility of a Tridharash Ralinganam of Sahityam. Nobody speaks about that in the pre-modern period. You know, it's really a, a modern uh, problem. And, uh, uh, we need to see these things as emerging from a certain kind of formation which comes up. And so literature as we understand it now is not something which existed all the time. 
Uh, but at the same time, I'm not saying that there are no practices or no chops or no effects which actually resonate with each other. I'm not saying that in the 19th century, suddenly one day people woke up and they began uh, having new kinds of pleasures. No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, they do have new kinds of pleasures. But new kinds of pleasures, the newness is often so much admixed with the familiar that it takes a period of time, uh, inner time as well as outer time, for it to be recognized as new, for it to be made intelligible as new, for it to be experienced as new. So, uh, uh, when I was a little bit at a loss as to what to speak about here, Janaki very kindly told me that some colleagues here were interested in a, a bit of work which I had done many years ago on uh, the making of uh, Malayalam writing as a kind of national, uh, national literature. Yeah? Here we need to understand the word nation. It uh, should not be automatically collapsed with the political formation of a nation state. We need to understand it as an effect of a uh, certain uh, uh, discourse of belonging to a nation where ideas of territory, ideas of language, etc. are quite important. Uh, this work which I had done was uh, mainly an attempt to look at uh, early literary histories in Malayalam. Uh, the earliest literary history, as most of you would know, is, was written in 1881. Yeah. And it was written by uh, a man called P. Govinda Pilla, uh, who was uh, the Sarvadhigarika of uh, Travancore Palace. Uh, so it's not really uh, an academic institution, you know, which, which does it. You know, he he uh, uh, produces his uh, 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 literary history. And he says that. Uh, what are the main aims of writing a literary history at that time? And he says that Malayalam lacks many of the authoritative texts that any language ought to have, any language worth its salt ought to have. Yeah? Uh, what are these authoritative texts? So three things which he mentions uh, are mentioned in a language which really comes from uh, traditions of thinking about authoritative discourses, he says that we should have books which deal with Vyagaranam, Alangaram, and Tattva. Yeah. But then there is this fourth thing called Sahitya Charitra, which is actually a, a new idea. Uh, so we need all these four things. And uh, what he is trying to do is to write the Sahitya Charitra. And then comes the second impulse. The second impulse is actually that of paying homage to the poets in the language. At that time, this calls, the, we say, the poet as kind of synonymous with the idea of the writer, the literary practitioner. Because most of the writing you know, was uh, in verse. You know? And uh, there is interesting work, including by uh, uh, a faculty member in Manipal, Ashoka Nambia, on the importance of versification when the early prose emerges. Yeah. Uh, like the novels, as you know, most of them have these epigraphs which are in verse. And uh, 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 like uh, Mira's beautiful paper yesterday spoke about the reading woman, you know, like what in Dileka and uh, Mathwan trade with each other as shlokas, you know, from Shaguntalam. You know, and uh, uh, so there are many things to be said about this. Uh, the, the kind of habitus, literary habitus, which comes from the world of words. And Ashoka Nambia also speaks about uh, this very interesting introduction that a, a newspaper editor of the time uh, writes, uh, mentions, where he says that when he started the newspaper, it was very difficult to find people could, who could send news reports, because many of them would send him news reports in words. And uh, uh, so we should understand that what we uh, Benedict and their Sony and modernity of time, you know, but the news reports are coming in words forms. Yeah? And so there are very interesting things to think about. So it is this, uh, uh, in this context that we should also think about this idea of paying homage to the voyage. Now, we know that this act of paying homage as a practice, on the one hand, is of course uh, an act of uh, devotion, an act of obeisance, you could say by which you are actually paying homage to something which you inherit. Yeah? 
But we know that these practices are also performatives in a certain sense. They're also producing a tradition, depending on who you identify as the poets of the past, worthy of veneration. Yeah? And so what you present as inheritance itself may be an effect of a certain practice of acquisition by which you create and uh, inhabit a certain heritage. And of course, you also leave out a lot of things. If you're thinking about yourself as selecting from an empirical universe of objects, but that is not quite the way people thought about it always at that time. So I've written something about, you know, these are obvious things now. There are a lot of scholars who have done a lot more work on these things now about the uh, uh, absence of Arabi Malayalam that, of course, you know, people have written a lot about it in recent years and very good studies coming up. Uh, but also Tamil, you know, it's very interesting. You know, Tamil uh, literary production from the, but Sanskrit literary production is very important. In, in going the place, uh, uh, literary history. And then you get to the 1920s uh, for the next set of literary histories, uh, where you get uh, literary histories by P. Shankaran Nambia, Artur Krishna Pisharadi, yeah? and uh, then importantly, the seven volume literary history, which begins its publication in 1929 and goes on till 1940 or so by R. Narayana Pandya. Now, what was interesting in looking at these literary histories for me was to ask the question, who is the historical subject of what we call Kerala literature or Malayalam literature? You know, how is this historical subject produced as an effect of this discourse? You know, how does it conceive it? You know, how does it uh, uh, discursively actualize it through this historical inquiry? And there, what we interestingly find is that these are really about the idea of communities, you know, caste communities. And communities, we also know that this is precisely the time which we often associate with Navothanam. This is the time when caste communities, many of them, try to redefine them in terms of practices and discourses as new ideas of community formations, uh, what we call samudayam, yeah, the idea of samudayam. On the one hand, uh, this idea of the samudayam has a very close relationship with modern technologies of governmentality, like census, for instance. New forms emerge, like the petition, the mass petition, which is very important as a form to study, because uh, in, in the political life of uh, 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 cultures like ours, the petition still is a very important mode or a form in which political subjectivities and uh, demands for justice are articulated. Yeah. It has a juridical dimension, but it also has other kinds of public dimensions. So th this is the period we are talking about. Huh? This is precisely the time when, on the one hand, you have the idea of a samadayam as uh, a modern notion of innumerable community, uh, which also can be the ground of an organization with its own distinctive objectives, plans of action, agenda, as one would call it. Uh, and also certain ideas of justice, equity, etc. being made at this time. But also there is another idea of samudayam which also comes, which breaks with the idea of caste altogether, but also in some sense has elements which cannot be contained by this new notion of the innumerable community. Uh, uh, Narayanan kindly uh, mentioned some of the things which I uh, some, some things I wrote on Narayana Guru, but there is even more, you know, far more important work, like uh, the most provocative work on, uh, the most profound work on Narayana Guru by people like uh, Nisar Ahmad, for instance, uh, which cannot be really, you know, uh, be accommodated into uh, Navodhanam if we consider it as a category of uh, historical time in the sense in which I spoke about it at the beginning. You know? so, this is the time when these literary histories are being formed, because when we read them, we may feel that, you know, when you go to the uh, clubhouse room or Navalthana, when you go to the clubhouse room on literary history and these caste articulations which are happening there, you may think that you are in two different spaces, but there is an interesting historical conjuncture, you know, which holds them together, even as their, their implications are uh, 
uh, in some sort of tension. Yeah. Now, uh, the modern idea of literature in Kerala really emerges from this period in time. So I, I think uh, I'll, I'll try to wind up in another five to ten minutes. Is that okay? Uh, there are, you know, there are Sanskrit scholars here. They would, they would be able to say much more about this. I, I, I do not know Sanskrit. But one interesting thing which comes up is also a discussion about because literature is uh, also a point of investment because it is really about language. Govinda Pillar called his uh, literary history itself Malayala Bhasha yeah? Jaritam, and uh, 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 the idea that Bhasha is really uh, the real embodiment of Bhasha is Sahitya. This, this idea is very much there. And one of the arguments which really uh, come in relationship to the positioning of Malayalam language, which is also argument about the positioning of Malayalam literature, is its relationship with uh, Sanskrit on the one hand and Tamil on the other, you know, which as you can see leaves out the entire set of questions about Malayalam's relationship with other languages, you know, be it Arabic, Syrian, you know, many of the other languages. And we, where now we have uh, some accounts coming from the study of oceanic histories and the longer period of exchange between this region you know, and uh, other parts of the world. Yeah. Now, they are, they are singularly absent in this self-definition of language as a cultural space. Yeah. And uh, in this one crucial text which comes to the foreground at this time is uh, Leela Pelagam, you know, which is a Sanskrit text. Uh, supposed to be a 14th century text. Now, interestingly, it is published uh, in uh, Kerala in the first decade of the 20th century. And you get uh, Ajay Krishna uh, uh, commenting on it. Then it becomes a crucial text in his literary history. And it is routinely invoked in the context of speaking about the history of Malayalam language because uh, it is argued that it is in Leela Tilagam that we first see a kind of isolation of uh, what we now call Malayalam language as, a, uh, as an object of thought. Yeah? Uh, it is called Pasha. And uh, Pasha is, you know, as many, most of you would know, Leela Tilagam uh, is really about Manipravalam poetry, which combines Sanskrit words with what would be called Pasha words. Yeah? Uh, uh, the, the word Pasha itself, you know that in the 19th century, uh, Pasha also uh, indicated, it was a kind of word which indicated Malayalam's relationship with Sanskrit. Like, if you translate from uh, a Sanskrit, a, san, from the Sanskrit a text into Malayalam language, uh, you would not usually say Vivartanam, uh, Peripasha, uh, certainly not Tarjima, uh, but you would call it Pasha Shavandalam. Uh, you have Pasha Gaudiliyam from an earlier time. Yeah. So Pasha also has, a, interestingly, this index of a relationship, you know, which is in its earlier uses. Yeah. So uh, Pasha, Pasha is seen as that kind of language which is spoken in uh, South India in this language region, which can be combined with Sanskrit words in the production of Manitavad, which means that certain other uh, uh, forms of use of language in this uh, territory should are not appropriate for it, especially uh, dialects from eastern uh, Tamil Nadu you know, uh, are not eligible for this. Uh, then Leela Telegram also mentions that this is the language used by the Trivarnikas, the three Varnas, upper Varnas, and they should be distinguished from the eastern dialects which are actually associated with the Hina Jatis. There are very interesting studies on this, of course, by Rako Weiger, then uh, more recently Richard Freeman, you know, and uh, they're very interesting things. But what's fascinating is that this is a kind of language context and a language differentiation context. But very quickly, and of course it has also its, its ethnic connotations there, but very quickly, by the time we come to the middle of the 20th century and later, it becomes deeply embroiled in a uh, discursive contestation about who is the subject of Malayalam literature. You know, when we come to Ilangulam Punyambilla, for example. Now, Leela Tilagam is no longer used for this particular words, which actually speaks about Pasha, 
but it is uh, read more for the examples which it gives of Manitravala writing, which are all erotic verses, so mostly erotic verses. And these erotic verses are now seen as an example of the Nambudiri Brahminical culture, the, the decadent aspects of the Nambudiri Brahminical culture, who in some sense it is claimed wasted the Sanskrit inheritance and used it only to uh, uh, do this um, uh, low pleasures, you could say, for these low pleasures. So the true inheritor, or the more noble inheritor of these, of what we call literary pleasure and the Sanskrit heritage, becomes the non nambudri subject who has access to Sanskrit learning, who can compose poetry, who also is seen as native to the region and different from the Brahmin who comes from elsewhere, etc., etc. Ilagula Vijamila is one important example of that. There are, you know, I, I present it in a kind of uh, uh, schematic form, uh, but it, in some sense it's a schematic argument. But you will also find details, questions of detail, which come in there in various ways. Now, Ilagula Vijamila is new here because you can see this process happening right from the Vigovinda Pillar's text as we move towards Narayana Pankir's. P. Govinda Pillar speaks about the denial of Sanskrit education to non brahminical cause as one of the things which prevented Kerala from fulfilling its literary possibilities. Uh, by the time you come to Narayana Panikya, he also speaks about certain forms of resistance, like for example, the uh, uh, deshi names which are given to people, yeah, which are seen as corrupted versions of Sanskrit names. Uh, Govinda Pillar sees them as the result of the denial of education to people. By the time you come to Narayana Panikir, it is seen as an act of resistance that we willfully do not use Sanskrit names. We actually use these uh, local origin names. So this formation is interesting. Now, I, I'm sorry I spent too much time talking about it. Uh, this formation is interesting because this points to a kind of uh, ambivalence right at the heart of literary discourse. But there is no Kerala people, you know. It's actually, uh, it is discursively being produced and uh, discursively produced and materially produced through the circulation of print culture, uh, through travel, you know, there are many, many things which are happening there. Uh, but what is the space of the people to write this Malayala Bhasha? Who is the subject of Malayala Bhasha? And under that idea of the virtual entity called the people, you have actually Equally importantly, these particular communities and their contestations coming into presence there. That is very much there. This creates a, a very important uh, dimension of ambivalence. You know, caste is one aspect of it. On the one hand, you have an idea of a domain of civil behavior, you know, uh, a behavior where you behave like an equal participant in a discursive space, making arguments, counter-arguments, putting forward your literary work for criticism, commentary, etc., etc. But in the early years, very explicitly, you also find a lot of what one would call uncivil behavior coming into that space. This may come in, come in the form of uh, expressions which have a double meaning, which carry caste insults with them, uh, uh, sometimes openly criticizing the entry of certain communities into the literary space by uh, uh, casting aspersions uh, on their uh, competence to produce anything like literature. Uh, these kinds of comments are made especially about uh, uh, Christian writers and uh, also about the lower caste writers uh, from Irava community onwards, but most uh, crudely about people like Yupi Karupan, for instance. And, and uh, so this is done in it. So the, the game of literary criticism and literary debate is also a kind of particular kind of language game, where you may apparently write in a language which seeks these claims to a kind of universality, which is uh, uh, posited at the level of a national literature, but along with that, gesturally, it also invokes 
a, play, a, a kind of a, a, a sense of or claim about differential merit, differential rights that communities ought to have to participate in this. And many of them are also related to stigmatizing the participants or stigmatizing communities, etc., etc. Now, this is very important because I feel that the, the space of literature in uh, uh, the modern world, not only in Kerala, but uh, in most of the world, is, has an element of this ambivalence. On the one hand, we tend to think about literature, there is an assumption that literature really is, it requires a special kind of reading. You know? uh, this is fiction, we often say, when somebody you know, complains about uh, uh, the hurt caused by a literary work, etc., etc. We know that these people are not adequately uh, groomed in the, in the norms and mores of uh, modern civil behavior. But on the other hand, there is always the question as to li the literary utterance being a public utterance at one level like any other utterance. Because the modern idea of literature does not require special qualifications on the part of its readership. Uh, the, uh, Jacques Concier, this French uh, theorist, philosopher, he spoke about the modern idea of literature as uh, the writing which is read by put people who are not supposed to read. The idea here is that people who do not need to have any special qualification. You do not really need to be the Sakradaya as it is understood in a uh, uh, Sanskrit text. Or you do not need to be uh, the expert, as we often think about uh, in television debates in the modern context, who can comment on something. You know, there is nothing of that. So there is this ambivalence which is very, very central uh, to the idea of literature. And it, in, some, in some sense, we also tend to forget that we, we probably suppress it when we uh, identify a literary ideology. When we put it into the questions of practice, what we really need to deal with is this constitutively ambivalent character of uh, uh, the literary formation. Now, uh, the, the last set of things which I wanted to say, I just very quickly abridge this. Uh, so, in, in the context of uh, our, uh, uh, our own kind of preoccupations in the present, if one were to uh, undertake a similar kind of inquiry in relationship to literature in the present, then of course what we need to also disturb and challenge is a certain historical narrative which have come to us, uh, which do not actually show all these stains which I try to exhibit in relationship to uh, Govinda Pilla or uh, uh, Narayana Panikir or people like that, but where we get a kind of coherent discourse of the literature of a democratic state, you know, which we often identify with uh, uh, the, its beginnings with the Navodhanam, for instance, and we tend to think about a, uh, a pluralistic society, uh, and, and we criticize people who do not really subscribe to that pluralistic vision, and we tend to make our arguments on the basis of uh, exclusion and inclusion. Yeah. And now, this also can lead to a, a certain kind of uh, thinking problem, like is our problem really one of uh, expanding the domain of national literature and keeping it as national literature? Or is it to challenge the idea of a national literature? Yeah. This is really the challenge as I see it in the present. Yeah. Like often the demands we make are really about inclusion in a, uh, what one may call a, a additive sense like we also want this, also is probably the English word which best exemplifies it. We do not, not want to have this, we want to have this. So everything ought to be there in that space which we call national literature. Now, what is the idea of a nation in relationship to this entire set of things which are presented in that domain? Now, often there is a, an assumption that uh, the nation presents itself as the other of something else. Now, of course, there are certain forms of nationalism which pitch themselves in this way. Where now, now we are familiar with that in the contemporary Indian context very much. Now, certain things are 
not seen as national, certain kinds of expression need to prove, prove their nationality in some sense. But even more importantly, if, even if less visibly, is the other logic of uh, national belonging and national inclusion, which uh, Ajay Skaria once uh, wrote a piece called The Local Life, Local Life of Nationhood. Yeah? It's a very, very interesting essay, where he tries to show that uh, the move of the nationalist discourse really is not about saying that, look, this is the nation and everybody should conform to that. It is more that this particular that you think that you are, its true meaning is really obtainable only if you identify that this is the nation. So if I am a particular kind of uh, uh, subject within the context of India, the true meaning of my this particularity is to be found not in this particularity, is to be found it's in its intelligibility as a form of the nation. Yeah. Uh, the classic example that Ajit Kariya writes is uh, Nehru arriving in uh, Punjab or Haryana uh, during the national movement period and uh, people shout Bharat Mata Ki Jai and then he begins his, uh, his speech. Uh, uh, a very good example of nationalist pedagogy by asking, what is this Bharat? You tell me, it's a Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, when a question like that comes, people are wise, they keep silent. They know that it's a trick question. You know? and so then Nehru says, is it the trees, is it the rivers, is it the mountains? And then, uh, is it, uh, you know, Delhi, you know, etc. Then he picks up the soil from the ground and says, this is Bharat. Yeah. So this particular soil, its true meaning is that it is Bharat. It is not this village. Its village's true meaning is that. So there is, this, this is a logic of inclusion. You know? And uh, uh, where the inclusion works by putting under erasure the particular, yeah? in, order for, in order to transcend it to pave the way for a truer intelligibility, which we call the nation. Yeah? Now, one of the problems of a simple, additive, inclusive argument about national literatures and national culture is precisely that it would assign the meaning of the particular precisely in terms of what we call the nation. And that nation may be a gallery of pluralities, a bouquet of flowers, whatever you may want to call it. But there is that assumption. So at the moment, probably, what would, what would offer a kind of counterpoint to this? What would be a way to kind of rub against this something, you know, so that we can see something, something new inside? So we need to probably look for forms of uh, uh, expression, articulation, uh, in literature as well as from elsewhere, because often what happens in literature or what arises in literature is not really unique to literature. And what we find uh, in literature there becomes a space where we can see it because there, there is a certain kind of reading, a certain kind of discursive engagement, which uh, in modern societies, it invites you to deploy on it. Our forms of uh, life and forms of subjectivity, forms of uh, embeddedness, uh, relationality, which are not accommodatable into this space, uh, which, which cannot inhabit the space comfortably. And otherwise, uh, because of the strength of a progressive, uh, progressive self-perception, progressive and inclusive self-perception, one may also have a real danger of uh, an intellectual and affective majoritarianism. So there, the counterpoint to that is to be sought not in finding yet, more, yet one more form of identity which we can include and call it within this panoply of identities which we, which we take pride in, but to find that which cannot be accommodated. And, and make that as a locus, as a minoritized locus from which to look at this uh, possibility of uh, a threat uh, 
frightening possibility of a majoritarianism. Because we usually contrast it with more reprehensible forms of majoritarianism which are out there in the open. But the, that which is intimate to us within ourselves, that really is probably what the task of something like uh, uh, a cultural studies inspired approach to the question of Kerala's literature would be in the present. You know, this, is, uh, uh, this is the thought I wanted to present before you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dave, for this really illuminating uh, presentation. In the first part, we basically problematized the whole idea or practice of cultural studies by looking at the diverse trajectories within which cultural studies has been idiomatized, practiced within India. Uh, and the movement from what one would call questions of representation to questions of practice. And the second part, I would think, not a very veiled, but a very suggestive questioning problematization of what we understand as the connection between literature and nation especially in the context of the idea of inclusivity primarily which functions more in terms of the particular getting submerged within what one would call the bouquet of flowers of the nation and where he concluded that what may be of vital importance today is to focus on or enrich that particular particularity which is not in tune with, in consonance with what is perceived to be the national, but what could question it, threaten it, and probably even raise up the possibilities of other idioms of the nation or the non-nation. Anyway, there is a lot of food for thought and certainly food for questions. I would invite you to ask questions or argue with Uday and I'm sure he'll be happy to respond. Yeah. 
of uh, the problem of national literature if we try to kind of resolve it through a simple model of inclusion. Now we know that exclusion and inclusion themselves are uh, have two different dimensions to them, at least two different dimensions to them. One of them is a kind of um, uh, positivistic notion of inclusion and exclusion where you can say that something is inside this, something is outside this. And the other is the idea that you need to exclude something in order for the domain to exist itself. The moment the excluded element is brought in, the domain of inclusion itself will begin to fall apart. So the, it's only the second kind of uh, uh, exclusion which is uh, interesting in terms of thinking, you know, which actually poses a challenge. But it is very easy to convert the second kind of, the more important kind of exclusion and the problems it raises to one of an empirical exclusion which we may identify as a historical exclusion because of certain reasons, which can be remedied by an empirical inclusion and a celebration in terms of uh, 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 the bouquet of flowers kind of model, like we have a more, more inclusive democratic culture at the moment. Yeah. This may actually, even though this uh, uh, seemingly satisfactory solution may actually involve a sidestepping of the, the real desires which are operating in uh, something like this. And it is, that, uh, the, uh, it is that the nature of that real desire and the kind of pleasures which come from that, that I try to indicate by speaking about a certain danger of majoritarianism there. Because when uh, uh, when a uh, public culture, when a public uh, sphere becomes uh, consensual in its understanding, or seemingly consensual in its understanding of what the national culture is, yeah, and what uh, uh, its norms of inclusion are, and try to include everything within it without questioning uh, its assumptions or foundations, there is certainly a problem of uh, uh, majoritarianism of this kind happening. And this is very easy to uh, happen in a place like Kerala where there are reprehensible other models of majoritarianism against which we can define ourselves. Yeah. Now, this problem I see as uh, more important now than probably 10 or 15 years ago, which is also why it is difficult to speak about it, because we do not really have the time or the patience to think through it. You know. There is a certain effect of satisfaction or self-congratulation, you know, or, or, which also combines with a, a uh, volatile intolerance about anything which criticizes that image of self-congratulation, yeah? uh, which we see manifest in the public space quite a lot. And so if you look at the effective registers of it, then one may see that there is really something else going on there. And so if uh, the task of cultural studies uh, inquiry, as I tried to indicate in the beginning, is to uh, make the present unfamiliar to us and make us think that we do not really know our present, then it will be important really to shake up that image of coherence. This is really what I was trying to get. Sir, I came at the flag of your president, sorry for that. Of the population as being incapable of producing it. So I think I heard you right. 
ma poi è proprio il serio, non è responsabile. Sì, ma è capace di produrre il discorso. Sì. E ci va bene. Quindi, credo che mi posso dare un esempio. That was in 2005, when Zuma really could make a rather disparaging statement about Zakaria, in which he used such words like Rambar and Devila, high-range estate, highly penetrative terms in the context. So I remember the period in which it appeared. But it was discussed in a little magazine called Why and published from that shape. So there was a, uh, a, a complimentary kind of uh, comment by a piece well known writing. So after these two appeared, I wrote a letter. I didn't hope to get it published, I wrote, if what these two said is correctly printed, then the Vedum Bala Mahavira. These are the words I used. But then the editor was kind enough to publish it. So that has gone down in Palayam literature as, as probably the only comment of this kind about Suma or any woman. So, <laughs> but I had in mind. But more, uh, other than this, in 87, uh, after the FF, the well-known uh, comment which was called by Professor Scholar, published a paper called Beyond, uh, Beyond Interpretation or the Business of Rewriting in which he equated uh, translators with critics. He said both of them are rewriting. Okay. And he quoted, I believe, Frederick Jensen, who said that every bit of criticism is something that you do uh, based on a particular master code. Okay. So you have a master code, I have a master code. But that is not how critics and cultural studies scholars are looked upon in our culture, in all cultures, I believe. They have a certain kind of authority. So if Sumadariko says this, or if M.P. Shankutinayar says that uh, uh, minority communities are incapable of writing poetry, so they are going to say it, I don't Okay, and that poetry doesn't come to them. So we give them a certain kind of value because they have this authority. Yes. As critics. So I think that we are very clearly deep on that. Unfortunately, it is not sunk in our society. Yes, that's very clear. He said they are also rewriting. If a translator is rewriting a text, he said translation is a form of rewriting. You can't expect to have a faithful reproduction of the text, he said. So this is happening simultaneously. But I think that is one problem. Many such things have not sunk in what people have said elsewhere. This I think is a very important thing. Okay, who do you respond to? Thank you. I, I totally agree with you. Know, I, I would say that people like Simon Reports and Rubinayar, they are part of the literary critical establishment. We know what they pay to see them as uh, really part of the discourse of literature and literary criticism rather than cultural studies. But uh, you are absolutely right. This is precisely that uh, double meaning discourse, you know, which seemingly uh, uh, presents an argument at the level of literature, the merit of uh, writing by certain people, etc., etc., but at the same time uh, suffuses it with uh, a kind of uh, 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 exchange which is not seen as appropriate for literary criticism. So, cast insults, you know, like I mentioned J.P. Karapen's name, you know, that one of the early uh, well known incidents of this was. Uh, this K. Ramakrishna Pillai's review of a play by uh, Pandit Kipi Karupan uh, called Bala Galaisham, and in which uh, he's making a criticism of uh, the play based on its improprieties, its infelicities, etc. But then it is also suffused with images of uh, rowing about, fishing, etc. It's really about uh, the caste. So this is caste stigma. So their inter the template of interpretative language, the template of debates, rational debates, etc., will not allow us to understand this critical practice. We need to look at the practice of caste insult, stigmatization, exposure, a complicitous appellation, interpellation of the readership, many of these things which need to come in there. So a similar work, that, that would be the task of cultural studies, precisely to do that in relationship to this. 
not to create a more civic behavior, but to understand that this is really that formation. So do not really have an ideal image of it. This is that particular idea that we call the living space. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. Uh, sir, uh, you told that uh, there was once a debate uh, on the topic that uh, who should be the subject of literature. So, according to you, who should be the subject of we may be able to look at literature as if it is not coming from a subject. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as you say, has this very interesting description of history as a process without a subject. Yeah. So we may, that opens up certain possibilities. You know, and including the attempt to claim a position of the subject to determine authorities and protocols of meaning, etc. Et But it's a very, very good question. The presentation was going to be human uh, Actually, uh, a couple of questions like uh, uh, you said you know, about uh, the consumer not being a great taxi. You know, uh, but is it you know, the sense of the consumer being you know, an active agent? Is it the kind of illusion that the capitalist culture has been able to create? Is one question. Because it creates an illusion of all being not empowered, especially yes. social media and things like that. But at the same time, it is empowering. Us. And uh, my second question is, uh, you said, uh, in Kerala only we have this rare species called the Samskai, I don't know. So I think uh, the species in Kerala, it is an kind of genetic mutation, I think. And uh, is it Kerala the only place, you know, where one can become a Samskai in I a self-styled Samskai in I? Because any event takes place, there is a list of Samskai in I who are protesting against it, and at the bottom you can see the signatories in groups, you know, the very people who are organizing the signature campaign, and they are all you know, subscribing like one. And uh, like, you know, I think another place where subscribing idols are telling such a series, as you can see from, you know, Ronald Barthes say now, uh, is Paris, Paris intellectuals. And Paris intellectuals are considered to be intellectuals according to, you know, uh, Foucault, he once said, only 25% of what we speak are unintelligible to the people that are considered to be intellectuals. As, uh, Kerala too good, or does Kerala suffer from a similar kind of syndrome? Thank, thank you. See, um, uh, first of all, this is something I think is a very interesting question. Uh, see, this, this also has something to do with the distinction I was trying to make between uh, a certain uh, structure of an object uh, or a certain uh, a structural description of a, uh, a certain phenomenon and the logic of practice. Yeah? Now we know that uh, commodity, uh, the modern idea of the commodity is really uh, uh, intimately related to a certain kind of production and distribution, which involves a suppression of the process of production from the process of distribution. That is the market, actually you cannot, you cannot thematize production. That is really what makes it into the fetish. Yeah? So we, we have tend to, so uh, Marx's own words are very interesting, like objects behave, begin to behave as if they have a life of their own. You know, there is something metaphysical you know, about the commodity in that sense. So in relationship to the agentiveness of the objects, the recipients uh, of that, the people who hold it, and, and uh, the people who sell it to, you know, they become parts of a chain over which they do not have any control. So there is a certain idea of passivity. Now, our idea of consumption generally have tried to uh, understand it in terms of this uh, manipulation of the person who is consuming it. So in that sense, consumption is a process by which we become heteronomous, uh, we uh, cease to have any freedom, we are compromising our freedom, we become 
uh, subservient to uh, the people who produce the commodity or sell it to us, etc. Et this is true. I'm not quarreling with that. But I'm suggesting that in a place where uh, the access to commodities themselves have been traditionally constrained by structures of uh, discrimination and oppression, whether it be in apartheid South Africa or in the caste system uh, in India, uh, or the stigmatization of certain com communities in, in the context of social life. You know, here I follow Anike Javre's uh, uh, line of thinking that it's very difficult to think about something called a society in a place like that. You, know? you may have particular, uh, particular circuits of sociability, but you may not have a society. So there, we know that it is Marx also who pointed out that capitalism breaks down all barriers. Uh, all that is solid, melts into thin air. So there, one may also see this same consumption, which is manipulative, also producing certain avenues for articulation of subjectivities which were previously unavailable. Now, this, this is not an entirely new uh, thing. You know, like we know that the wearing of the blouse, for example, you know, uh, uh, the wearing of uh, new forms of clothing. Know, previously unavailable to uh, uh, caste groups, communities uh, earlier. But this availability does not mean that everybody would want to wear it. Yeah. As we know in the, in the recent debates also, like it's not as if there is one capitalist logic which pushes the entire population towards certain kinds of clothing which are seen as modern. But indexing oneself as modern through consumption may become important for certain social groups at certain times. That, that is, see, the problem is also to the, uh, from the, our habits of thinking about agency and uh, passivity as uh, binary opposites. It is very often the case that they are very closely uh, mixed together. And you know, what authorizes you to become an agent may also make you passive in relationship to certain things. So, so that is my way of looking at it, but thanks for that question. And about Samskari and I, and I was making a more light-hearted comment, you know, so I do not really want to put too much weight on that. You know? uh, but it's very interesting that uh, unlike uh, the idea of uh, uh, the uh, Jean-Paul Sartre speaking on the street corner in uh, 1968 or you know, something like that, uh, in, in the modern contemporary media culture, when anything happens, it's customary for uh, the media to approach uh, certain writers uh, as if uh, they will speak for the Kerala nation, you know, for the Kerala uh, civil society or public culture. Now, writers themselves, of course, uh, uh, contribute to this enormously, yeah? and uh, to all kinds of media. So, for me, What's interesting is not this particular figure of the intellectual as much as the formation to which it belongs. That is precisely that formation of uh, the national literature uh, which I was speaking about. But it was a more light-hearted comment. Mina had a Maybe after that we should... Thank you for a very really wonderful paper. Uh, just a very small question. Uh, there's a set of uh, very complexly intimate uh, practices, relationships that the local has with the nation, right? Uh, but when you look at Kerala, for example, in the last six years, five or six years, it's a very, uh, it's a paradigm shift in those relationships, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis what uh, people like Ajay Sariya has called the logic of transcendence, where there is a centrality of the local, but there is also you know, very many antagonistic kind of you know, imaginations. How do you respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that that's uh, I mean, it's mainly in response to that that I was trying to make that point about our yearning for a solution which is purely uh, uh, numerically inclusive. You know? Like, we would say that this is not accepted, this is not permitted, uh, we do not see this as Kerala, etc., etc. This is also Kerala. Yeah? And we need to uh, cherish it as part of uh, uh, the, the 
democratic inclusiveness of Kerala. And this is one response which really comes up. Now, uh, people who still persist in uh, criticizing these practices would make the argument that this is not really in tune with Kerala culture. We saw so many examples of this. Now, this is not really a, a matter of one particular political ideology. It's interesting that these gestures come up <coughs> from different uh, points in the political spectrum in terms of political ideology. Because what they invoke as a normative standard, in some cases, may be an idea of tradition which extends to the past and to uh, societies of privilege, etc., etc., like in the case of uh, that I quote, uh, say, which uh, uh, Sheriff mentioned. But some of it also may relate to the modern self image of Kerala as coming from uh, a period of Renaissance and uh, an enlightened Kerala. This is not in tune with that. So both of them, in some sense, really hold on to a certain notion of the national literature, of national culture, uh, which we see as uh, exceptional in relationship to other parts of India, you know, advanced in relationship to other parts of India, etc., etc. You know? And that is really where I have, a, I have an anxiety about it. You know? If uh, that is really uh, the horizon of our intellectual inquiry, uh, or the practice of the study of culture, then it may really get sucked into the ideology of the national. This time, parading under the sign of that which is progressive, that which is expansive, etc. Et this is really what I was trying to get at. Now, what is desirable? There is no answer to that. No? Yeah. yeah. Nation perceives? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what is the nation there? See, the nation is precisely this formation. You know? it, what is called nation is actually people who participate and speak on behalf of the nation, make arguments saying that this is Kerala culture. That is really what uh, nation is a purely virtual entity. It's not really like an empirical entity. Now, of course, it can create concrete things like the nation state, which is, of course, one of the consequences of that. But what we call this virtual entity called the nation, we should not really uh, reduce it to the idea of the nation state. That's, that's important. The question is whether a national imagination has inherently a statist aspiration. Uh, whether all nationalist imagination ultimately would want to create uh, jails to imprison people and uh, anti-nationals and uh, stigmatize people and purify the spaces which they inhabit. This is something important to think about. Which is why, uh, at the moment, I feel that uh, a kind of nationalism which does not identify itself in the name of the nation, because in terms of political formation, the nation is equated with the nation state. A, a, a idea of a Kerala nation, which is different, that itself is something which the contemporary culture studies need to uh, uh, engage with. This, this is the point that is trying to make. Maybe it's time, because I'm I'm sure there are several more questions, but uh, we are also running behind the clock. Uh, thank you, Uday, for a very exciting session, and especially the responses. Um, I hope the department will be able to invite you live for a series of lectures, in which case, uh, you know, there would be greater opportunity for better interaction. Uh, and just a thought came to my mind when they concluded, and that is where the problem would probably uh, dwell in the fact that sometimes difference erases differences. And the idea of Kerala exclusionism could actually erase the possibilities of differences within. Thank you for that thought. Thank you very much. Uh, we shall break for a short time for 10 minutes uh, and come back again uh, for the next presentation by Malavika Jayakumar.
And on behalf of everyone here, thanks a million. Thank you.